Yes, um, I'm here um, today um, as a sociologist who's interested in um, computational types of work. And my talk is uh, entitled, just very briefly, Text as Data. Um, so one of the ideas I have in conveying today to you is to talk about, um, or, or to, to enhance in a way, um, spillover of ideas. And um, there's this great book out by colleagues on the emergence of organizations and markets. They talk about network foldings across several disciplines. And I think today is an ideal setting where we perhaps can achieve such kinds of network foldings in terms of ideas and methods discussed. So um, one of the key ideas that we, we've, we've been gathering around uh, here today is the computational social science. And it's, I'm not going to go into any uh, attempt to make a definition of it, but I'm just going to say that I guess one of the main ideas is that it's data-driven um, computing techniques to study social behavior. There's also people of us here who work uh, in the area of social physics, who are interested in tracking, uh, um, working with trackable um, wearable sensors to study, predict, and to optimize social behavior. Then there's people here who are um, interested, and I think Susie just mentioned it a couple times, running the data science laboratory, uh, in data science, um, where uh, I guess statistics, math, and some sort of thematic focus folds together. Then there's people perhaps here who are interested in the digital humanities. Um, they're digitizing um, sources, they're analyzing connections, um, and we've seen recent interesting works on distant reading projects coming from the digital humanities. We also people here who are interested in computer linguistics and machine learning, um, an area which provides insights into cultural patterns through language. Now, I'd like to add to this, this uh, perspective of uh, sociology. And I'm going to say a little bit about what I mean by that so we're all on the same page. Now, um, what I mean is that sociology that studies relations that is interested in relations and events, that thinks relationally. This is sort of the sociology where I come from. Work brought us um, insights on processes of diffusion, of transitivity, homophily, strength of ties, and of course, um, ideas on structural equivalences. Um, we're interested in the analysis of processual, historical data, rather than making predictions and, uh, or even being engaged in social engineering projects of how things could be better at some other time. Rather, we're interested in the search for patterns. Um, in a way, the intuition is we know that the world is clustered and sort of bunched up in several ways, but how exactly is it bunched up? How can we, how can we understa understand that bunching up? So the big question is, is the, we're asking is the how question rather than the why. One of the um, important works in that area um, um, comes from, is, is a paper written by John Moore, Annual Review of Sociology 98, on an empirical, um, on, on empirical work in cultural sociology, US sociology. Um, where, the, where he focuses on meaning making from an empirical sociological point of view. And the intuition is that actors make meaning relationally in social contexts, so relations are important, and at particular times uh, where events and processes are of relevance. So questions here we may ask and that's sort of my work in particular. I'm interested in how new categories emerge from that particular point of view of how actors, um, and that's a broad category actually in my world, how, actor, how actors make meaning and uh, new categories might emerge. And 2000 and, uh, 2007, you all know that work, um, uh, the, the paper 
on the coming crisis of empirical uh, sociology was published, and I take from that another point um, of uh, um, trigger to talk a little bit about um, where, where we're at right now in sociology. Data and methods are being dramatically altered and um, expanded in a way. We have, just as Susie was just telling us, a, a richness and breadth of data that we can now deal with going beyond our standard interview, our, um, our surveys, our experiments, to reveal some better ways to address old questions. I think that's really key here. And at the same time, there are several challenges. Challenges about data collections, of course. We mentioned challenges about causation. You, you had to <laughs> answer questions about that. Which way around is it if we, if we have correlations? And also, um, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about here today as well, about data constructions. So what do we really do once we have billions of data points available? And how, how do we get a data set, really? Um, and I think sociologists are in a position to talk about um, the whole idea of data curating. Um, we know, and indeed, um, just this past week, the paper by... Um, Jürgen Pfeffer and Derek Ruth came out on uh, the need to manage the analytic bias we have in, in data sets. We get this data on the basis of, uh, it's already in it, the, the many algorithmic and other um, decisions made are already ingrained in the data. Um, and we also work with that data, of course, on the basis of particular theoretical models be it sociological or statistical, and expectations about the world. And another idea um, that was raised also in another famous paper, I'm just piggybacking on other people's famous work, um, by uh, Leder et al., the, I think this is the 2014 paper, um, the comment on the, the Google flu data, um, in a sense, the need for more theory. So now we have all this gigantic amounts of data. We perhaps have an idea about how to construct it. But we also need to make it explicit um, the relationship between sociological theory, data collection, data processing, data analysis. Are there new mechanisms to be found? What's the role of algorithms now that we have sort of this all data revolution that they speak of? Okay. So... Um, I'm going to go out on a limb in a way and say that <laughs> we have this sociology and perhaps we can um, speak of a uh, computational cultural sociology that can contribute to the larger discussion, discussion. I'm not going to say anything adds up to anything else. I think this is all a huge um, an area where there's many overlaps and perhaps foldings and spillovers um, eventually. So what do I mean exactly by that? Um, this kind of computational um, cultural sociology measures culture. It's not about only structural connections, but also using text, um, textual data to measure meaning. Um, these can be newly generated texts, such as in social media texts, but also old and newly digitized texts. This is where the digital humanities idea comes from. I would not make a, a qualitative, so far, qualitative difference between these types of data. Um, and it focuses on sociological concepts, for example, of frames and scripts that shape how people understand the world, how they make meaning of the world. And in particular, I'm interested in capturing this relationality of meaning like I said earlier, people make meaning in context. They make decision in particular contexts of time and social space. And this is what I think is, um, makes it particularly sociological. And it yields endogenous explanations of dynamic processes. We're focusing from explanations from the processes themselves. And it allows for the tracing of the evolution of meaning structures of a field, of a particular field, um, using longitudinal textual data. Okay, so this is my kind of outline of what this perhaps could be. Now let me turn to an empirical study. Um, 
for today's presentation, I thought to present you my work on restaurant reviews. It's an hour before lunch, so I thought I might get you uh, hungrier than you already are. So let's talk about food. Um, restaurant reviews are an interesting sociological um, present interesting sociological data. There's, of course, a large tradition in the sociology to talk about taste, to study taste. Bourdieu, of course, is one of the, the um, key people who've worked on taste. Um, and restaurant reviews, um, we have the reviewers, we have the field of reviews, we have reviewers who compete with each other, we have uh, the, the gastronomic field, we have reviewers who could make or break a restaurant, we have the whole world of uh, Michelin guides, etc. Um, but here I'm focusing on reviewers as critics who test, who evaluate, and who report what was tasted and experienced in a particular restaurant. So I'm actually not interested in the ratings and the reputation system, as Andreas Diekmann was talking earlier. I do have that data on that as well, but I'm actually looking at the texts of the reviewers, the reviewers have written, to get a sense. Um, in a way, an ex post ethnography. I wasn't there when those reviews were written. I wasn't there with the reviewers at the time they went to the restaurant. But to get a sense of what was tasted, um, and what was experienced at a particular time. And um, so it's interesting what experience are worthy of paying attention to in these reviews. What was tasted 10 years ago and what is tasted today? So these are kinds of the questions. The big research question is what are the structures and the dynamics of what was tasted, uh, tested and experienced by the restaurant, by restaurant reviewers? And my data um, consists of all reviews of uh, Berlin restaurants in full text published, uh, uh, full text published in two local magazines, Tip and City, um, between the years 1995 and 2012. So this is all, I don't know where I fall in. It's it's sort of small data to you, and it's big to me in a way. Um, uh, it's almost 1,700 um, reviews between these two. To magazines, so it's all reviews that uh, mention a restaurant is in the in the corpus. This was archival work. These um, magazines do not have digital copies of their reviews, so we had to go in um, and make photocopies, use the microphone, and scan the originals, and then transform from the paper format from the digital format into a machine readable text. Going through all sorts of Transformation. So this is really a digital humanities project in that sense at a small scale. This is how these reviews look like. You can tell this is not machine readable, so we had to go through lots of steps to get it, to get it going. So this is the wine guy, find a Küche für Weinkenner. This is yet another review on a Mexican restaurant and yet another on an haute cuisine with a start, a start restaurant just to give you a sense of how my data looks like. So then we had to clean the data. Also, this is another step where I, as a researcher, make decisions. What do I leave in? What do I throw out? Um, indeed, um, German language is not fun to work with, as a, especially as a non-linguist, because you have conjugation, you have declination. Is uh, What's the difference between and tush, and what do I what do I do? I have to deal with different tenses, etc. So lots of cleaning. And I heard you went to the eat Wiener Schnitzel. Um, Wiener Schnitzel is something that's uh, featured um, a lot in those um, data, and it seems to be important. So actually, oops, some of the stuff I uh, pulled together. So we have um, rote Beete, sehr gut, drei Gänge Menü. These were all pulled together, and lots of stuff thrown out. Stuff that's superfluous for the for the um, for the analysis. So this is how the data, just to give you a sense, I said it's important to talk about the data construction, how my data looks like, lots of uh, lines in a table of words, one word after the other. <coughs> so and for the dynamics um, of that, what was tasted, I used the um, tool of topic modeling, which um, 
Um, sociologists, uh, cultural sociologists are extremely excited about, in a way, cautious and excited. Because topic modeling um, helps us to discover the hidden thematic structure in large um, collections of documents. And they provide interpretable topics, that is, wor groups of words that are associated with a single theme. Um, and uh, it really captures some of that, what we as sociologists would uh, think about in terms of frames or scripts. I worked with um, LDA. Susie already mentioned um, that uh, she's done some LDA work as well and that corpus on Wikipedia. Here the idea is that each co textual corpus consists of multiple topics and um, each document exhibits these topics with different proportions. So you can imagine in one restaurant review it's not only about the smell of the cheese um, the reviewer experienced, but it's also about the uh, color of the tablecloth, how the restaurant looks like, what the service was like, how the wine tasted, etc. So we have several things going on in one review. And in topic modeling, co-occurrences of words are important because that's really what the relational meaning, where that relational meaning um, comes from. And at the same time, what's also nice is that there's a multiplicity of um, terms across topics. So one term in one topic could mean something very different uh, uh, from another topic. So it doesn't have to be one meaning only per term. Technically, um, it's a Bayesian probabilistic perspective. It's a statistical model of language, and it's a generative model. So there's discussion. I know we can talk about the, the the statistics behind it, it's not completely unproblematic, I know, but it's very meaningful to what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, because it, and I would, I would say from my perspective, LDA provides a lens for viewing a corpus of documents to see the data more clearly. So it's really an instrument used as a lens where I can adjust what my lens, where my lens is supposed to be. And it fits the theoretical um, theory and method really fit nicely as a tool to operationalize relationality and frames, like I said. Okay, so this is the classic when you go to an LDA uh, workshop. That's one of the classic um, uh, figures you see. This is by David Bly um, on how sort of the basic idea, the intuition behind topic modeling. Um, uh, uh, do each document consists of words with several topics and it's all based on a particular um, probabilistic um, statistics that um, Dirichlet allocation. Okay, now I'm going to show you some, throw some words at you. This is the result of a 30 um, topic unsupervised Gibbs LDA um, of different themes. I'm going to go closer into it. One of the things I found in those 30, um, from those 30 topics are different cuisines. I'm, I told you, you might get hungry. Um, we, we found in that corpus on the Berlin restaurant scene over those years, we found four Germanic topics, the German Nordic cuisine, Bavarian, sauerkraut, schnitzel, beer, sausages. You have the Austrian uh, topic, the Wiener schnitzel, the Tafelspitz, um, crispy, wonderful, we have the Swabian uh, cuisine, the Spätzle, the spinach, the Maultaschen. Then we have the Italian. So lots of these are extremely obvious topics of these different cuisines. The European, we have Asian cuisine, and we have vegan and vegetarian cuisine over there. Um, and what was also in those topics are different styles, sort of, in a way, different um, culinary styles. Three of them I'm just going to highlight. One is the um, a, a style on local quality and ambiance. It's about lunch and breakfast, people wearing black, perhaps something about black and people. Um, and another a topic on the new German cuisine, which is perfectly broiled, classic marinated, excellent, red beets and Riesling, combining that into a topic. 
And those two topics indeed um, were very interesting and I think that's sort of um, one of the things of the findings I'm going to talk about here uh, to you today is um, really the, the move from the brunch culture of the early 90s in Berlin to a new German cuisine, what we can see here. So whereas this sort of uh, brunch and lunch and hanging out um, uh, at cafes was tasted by the reviewers in the early 90s. Now the curve has gone down. That topic almost doesn't exist anymore. Rather, we, we reviewers taste and experience a lot of new German cuisine. Um, okay. So this is just to give you a sense of how um, a computational cultural sociology could approach these kinds of um, data from that perspective. Um, and look at these topical constructs of what reviewers tasted and experienced in their reports. We've seen a dynamic of the tasted. It goes from brunch to the German cuisine. Um, and for further interpretation, so topic modeling really is in a way just the start. For further um, interpretation, we would have to go into a qualitative analysis of the documents and the restaurants um, to really look at what, what, what happened, and also take exogenous events into account. We know Berlin experienced unification of a formerly divided city. We know there's gentrification processes, so it may not be all that surprising that brunch culture has moved into the new Berlin cuisine of the Riesling and the Red Beets. Um, and we also know that there's a changing population in um, in the city of Berlin after unification, when politicians moved in, where now lots of international tourists are in town. So perhaps that also has an effect on that, what was tasted um, by these reviewers. Okay. So what I wanted to suggest is to use machine learning um, to uh, an analyze texts, to complement interpretive approaches, to quantify the study of evaluation processes nevertheless, and to detect and analyze patterns that uh, may serve as a description um, uh, for explanation. Now, digital data is not equal to an automated analysis, but always curated decisions are necessary, not necessarily easier. And automated analysis is not necessarily an objective analysis, but rather needs to be transparent on how the data was um, generated from the original sources. Thank you very much. Very much for for your nice talk. I think this is a, a really nice counter example of the talk that Sophie gave, where you had Susie, a, uh, Susie. Uh, sorry. Two, two S's. Yeah. <laughs> Susie gave uh, where we had uh, hypotheses that were tested against the data, and here we have data in order to uh, uncover hypotheses. And I think this kind of uh, back and forth between data and hypotheses is something that we we are really interested in here. Um, okay, I want to open up uh, the fl floor for questions. Yes. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I was wondering, because you used the generative approach, um, how you came up with the 30 topics, because I also use LDA, and I already involved into that decision process um, the qualitative analysis part, so mm -hmm. I looked at ideal models, uh, ideal kinds of data types um, in order to define like the final topical solution. It was lots of testing. Uh, that's part of that. It's sort of a back and forth between my results of the data. Can I sort of the interpretive, the statistic validity, the interpretive validity of these, of these topics. 35 didn't work. 32 didn't work. There's always more junk happening, uh, coming up. So that's really what, what worked by chance. I mean, not by chance, but by testing out. So it's 30 by chance in that way. Otto, thank you very much for the presentation. And I probably don't have, but maybe it's possible to uh, come to the data uh, where the restaurants, especially in Berlin, where they were. I mean, with this information, you could map, in a way, yes. the creation of Prenzlberg and yes, yes. rise I was, and fall of that's the... That's one of the ideas I had originally. Um, I didn't go into the uh, details of, of the problems of the data. One is that, indeed, rather than when we think about these restaurant reviews, there's lots of stuff written about 
the, um, the esteemed reviewer, for example, in the New York Times and The Guardian, you know, they have their reviewers and they're like gods and queens of the gastronomic field. In these uh, magazines, as you may know, these are kind of regular people and they don't write regularly. There's only very few of these reviewers who uh, have been at any uh, magazine for an extended period of time. Oftentimes, I mean, you had sometimes even the... Um, the leading management ma manager go and re review restaurants or just sort of a, a brother of one of the writers review the restaurant. So these are not really professional reviewers. These are sort of lay people reviewers. And what I found, um, and I did plot the geolocation of these restaurants, I especially in that hope of finding, you know, sort of the Kreuzköln development, the Prenzlauer Berg. I'm not sure what I'm measuring. I think I'm measuring where these reviewers live perhaps, or where they decide to visit a friend. You know, I, I'm not sure what I'm measuring in, in, with that type of data set of the tip and city. And indeed, uh, I just realized, or I just saw earlier um, this year, uh, open, um, open Data City together with, uh, is, is coming up with a, with a map. Uh, both tip and city have been bought by the same uh, publication house just recently. So now they're using all that data that I manually um, transcribed. <laughs> they've, uh, they've also put now on, on a map. It's not as extensive as my data. They don't have the names of the reviewers. They don't have all of the reviews. But now you can go to goberlin.net to find those reviews. And you don't see the t over time, the processes over time in that, in that map. I have the processes over time, but I'm not sure what it says. That's the answer. Um, I found your idea very interesting. I thought a bit about the methodology. So you showed some of the topical clusters mm. and I was wondering whether one would need to change the methodology a bit. So right now you just like look at this unsupervised mechanism and then you find clusters mm -hmm. and it seemed to me that one would like to, to uh, purify them a bit. I mm -hmm. mean when you find something like Austrian Casino so it seems like one could really sort of like think about uh, enforcing some um, statistical correlation between terms because say like, I don't know, Kaiserschmarrn and Wiener Schnitzel always appears in the Austrian cuisine, stuff like that, where the whole process mm -hmm. would change from a completely unsupervised mm -hmm. uh, task into a mixture of doing a bit of unsupervised, doing a bit of uh, supervision on what's supposed to go together uh, from a kind of taxonomical point of view and then applying the unsupervised process again. And there are some methods for that, uh, but they are not quite as standard as uh, standard LDA uh, mm. application. Mm, thanks. Well, I think a little bit, I did a little bit of that by continuously cleaning the data, sort of similar to your answer with how many topics there are and, you know, finding stuff in those topics that didn't make any sense. So I went back and tried to, to get at some of that what stuff that goes together. In that sense, it's unsupervised, but of course, I'm constructing the data set. So in, is that unsupervised? I don't know. So yes, um, in a way, sort of manually, I did that. Not, not as extended as you think about, but mm -hmm. thanks. There was a question over here. Lots of questions, OK. First, move over there and a question in the back. I hope I'm not just repeating um, the question before, but um, I was wondering how you dealt with or will deal with um, um, the validation step that mm -hmm. might be necessary when you label the topics because LDA doesn't give you the, 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 the labels, it only gives you the words, so you have to kind of deduct or induct. Um, that's my big question too, if that's deduction and induction. Um, so there's a step of validation, uh, which was very sorely noticed by, by our team, for example, because we did a political analysis mm -hmm. of um, newspaper articles, and um, our purpose was to um, counteract like, biased interpretation um, within the data, um, like not to fall into leftist or rightist interpretations, right. and to kind of um, achieve more objectivity. So um, that, that validation step would be um, a prime concern to us and maybe for you too in, in, in very soon future. So that would be my question of, of how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some, 
of course, you, you know the literature on that, on the, the validation steps. Um, here I used a mixture of statistical validation measures, how far or how near the topics were with each other, and then interpretation in terms of does that go with my reading of the texts, right? So this is sort of the answer to the, to the validation. And on the contrary to your case, where you don't want to be primed by sort of left and right, I was looking for the obvious in a way, right? So I wasn't, my data set is not about crazy or sort of stuff that I don't see, but rather very much looking for the obvious. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I have a kind of meta question. Um, so you talked a lot about uh, now about uh, using computational methods for yeah. your data. So what are your ideas of now using more web data for the cases that you are doing? And what are the challenges? Like you also mentioned this article that just came out uh, some days ago. Mm. And this, this is kind of my first question. And the second one is um, coming from a computer scientist, what um, I like to hear your opinion, opinion on um, what we can now do with the findings that you have. Uh, mm -hmm. So what are future um, mm -hmm. uh, applications or, or mm -hmm. implications of this mm -hmm. kind of work? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Let me start from the, from the end because that's probably where I, I yes, where, where I thought more about, is, which is the what do we do now? Sort of this is sort of you have your topic model results, you're pretty certain that after back and forth over a number of weeks, this is what your, your data um, looks like. Now I would go and decide to tell the story of the Berlin gastronomic field and the changes and perhaps people, events, um, restaurants that play a role, perhaps start, you know, moves from the outside into the city, Michelin, guide, uh, Michelin guides, what do they say? So now I would start to tell the story on top of these kinds of heuristic, uh, the, the mapping of the field that topic modeling provides. And with, so I don't, I, perhaps that answers that last question. Um, and as to social media, I think topic modeling works for some stuff and it doesn't for others. Twitter data is very difficult to topic model, obviously, because of the short document strings. What do we, you know, there's lots of stuff that needs to be thrown out in, in um, Twitter data, uh, I, I fear. So I think it's probably best for lengthier texts. I've done lots of, lots of topic, to, uh, topic modeling on other texts. Newspaper articles work really well. Um, even web of science abstracts work really well. So I'm, uh, I don't know what that answer would be. Perhaps postings on blogs, <laughs> stuff like that would be more suitable than Twitter data. Yeah. You use, uh, uh, ah. Yelp. Right? I, I, I use magazine data. Yeah, I, I don't use d digital data already. I don't use Yelp um, or Quora or whatever. I don't do that. No. So the, the question is, do you see I'm a potential sorry. for these I'm kinds sorry. of I didn't, data? I, I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Um, I was going in another direction with your question. Um, I guess so, yes. I think it's difficult also because we know there's certain effects in these kinds of restaurant reviews when already somebody publishes, you know, we've heard before about reputation and sort of there's, there's games going on in terms of uh, who, who posts what at what time and, you know, if I see a positive review written, will I really write a negative review? So I think it's more difficult because who's the reviewer in a sense? We do have our position of the reviewer in that data set, whereas at other places it's more difficult to ascertain who's the reviewer, right? The reviewer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe uh, one more question. Uh, thanks, especially for the sticky term of computational cultural sociology, I like that. Um, <laughs> If I understood stood you correctly, you uh, put all your data into the uh, topic model, not distinguishing by year, and oh. then time emerged. No, 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 by year, by year. By year, so yeah, you yeah. did a topic model for each year. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. uh, oh no, sorry. So, it's, so yes, all in that particular, what I, what I showed here is all 
in there, but it's, it's labeled by year. So I plotted the topics over time by year. But you did not feed the year information into the topic model in the beginning. You did not do one topic model for each year. No. So is that um, because I have made good experience with doing exactly that thing and time emerges from that method? Do you have that same experience? Is that a good approach? Uh, we, we can, I'm happy to talk about it later, but actually it was a very, uh, um, it was a mess in my data, so I didn't pursue it any further. <laughs> that was just causing headaches rather than happiness on my end. <laughs> okay, so maybe one final question and then we wrap up this session. Um, thanks for your talk. So I was also wondering whether you have any additional information about the reviewers, because you said like you don't know whether you just measure where they live or this kind of stuff. So do you have any metadata on that? And um, did you look occasionally also into linguistic features, like, um, you know, differences in the style they write or these kind of things? Yes, so last question, yes, I did read all, you know, of course I did read through the reviews and have some um, ideas about how, who writes in what kind of style. In general, it's a sort of a loose, very informal style altogether. It's a very loose, informal style. Um, and I, I have data, of course, about how often they, um, they write. And I do have some ideas about these reviewers, but really my focus wasn't on the reviewers per se as people. I, I think the background of that question was because there are extensions to topic models, right? Like the right. author topic yeah, model. Yeah. You could actually model characteristics of the author and include it in your model and thereby... Uh, maybe control for certain aspects. But of really, they, some writing. of them only, you know, the most of them, I, and I don't have the stats here with me, write like two or three times over the entire period. So there's lots of changes of these reviewers. Right. And so I think it's not really helpful to go that way in yeah. that data set. But that might be something to consider when, when looking at larger data sets like yes. Yelp or the other. The Yelp stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm.